over the next several minutes, I'm going to discuss very briefly some historical aspects of Guillain-Barre syndrome. I will then focus on the clinical features of Guillain-Barre, including some of the variants we see in clinical practice. I will talk a little bit about the diagnostic approach to the disorder, uh, including consideration of uh, conditions in the differential diagnosis of the presentation. I'll focus very briefly on the pathogenesis of Guillain-Barre and then spend the rest of the time talking a little bit about the treatment and some prognostic aspects of the disorder. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of relevant, uh, interest that are relevant to this presentation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Rayner, my colleague, and Dr. Ted Burns for sharing some of their slides with me. In 1859, Landry first described a case of distal sensory formications and ascending weakness after a prodromal illness with fever, malaise, and pain, and this patient progressed to paralysis over three weeks and died from respiratory failure. In addition, he also described four similar cases. Sixty years later, two French army neurologists, Guillain and Barre, described an acute neuropathy in two soldiers and the classic cerebrospinal fluid uh, uh, finding of albuminocytologic dissociation. Stroll did the electrodiagnostic studies in these soldiers, and these authors distinguished the illness from acute paralytic poliomyelitis. The 1950s and 60s really saw tremendous research into the pathophysiology of the disorder along two paths. One, to delineate the electrophysiologic features of the disorder, and the other along the lines of pathogenesis and immunology. The 1980s and the 1990s were the decades of immunotherapy. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an acute monophasic immune-mediated polyradiculoneuropathy with a mean age of onset of about 40 years that affects slightly more males than females. It affects persons of all ages, races, and nationalities. The worldwide incidence of Guillain-Barre has been reported to be anywhere from 0.6 to 4 per 100,000 annually. Children tend to be affected slightly less frequently, whereas adults over the age of 50 years have a slightly greater incidence of the disorder. Two-thirds of cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome are associated with an antecedent infection. The typical cl clinical presentation of the disease is an acute, generalized, motor greater than sensory syndrome. The official name of the disorder is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, which emphasizes the time course and the pathology of the disease. I will use the term Guillain-Barre syndrome in this talk uh, to encompass AIDP and all its variants. The most common initial symptom of Guillain-Barre is paresthesia of the distal extremities. However, at this stage, patients have little objective sensory loss. Severe radicular back pain or neuropathic pain affects most cases and is commonly seen in the whole spectrum of Guillain-Barre and its variants. The diagnosis of Guillain-Barre, especially early on, in children can be difficult and a high index of suspicion is necessary because children may just present with pain, difficulty with walking, or even just plain refusal to walk. Within a few days, weakness ensues, commonly in a symmetric ascending pattern. However, weakness can be somewhat asymmetric, especially at the onset of the illness. Most patients present initially with proximal as well as distal weakness in the lower extremities that su subsequently spreads to the arms. This is the presentation in approximately half the patients. A third of the patients present with both leg and arm weakness, and a few patients, approximately 10 to 12 percent, have onset of weakness in the arms. Facial nerve involvement occurs in 70% uh, of cases, and oropharyngeal weakness or bulbar weakness with dysphagia in about 40%. Rarely, approximately 5% of patients may develop ophthalmoplegia, ptosis, or both, 
And in this case, the differential diagnosis of botulism or myasthenia gravis arises. Hearing loss, papilledema, and vocal cord paralysis are less common. A quarter to a third of the patients go on to develop respiratory failure, requiring ventilatory assistance. Autonomic dysfunction, predominantly in the form of cardiovascular dysregulation, is present in most patients if carefully looked for. But its severity varies quite highly. Uh, most often, dysautonomia is in the form of sinus tachycardia, but patients may also have bradycardia, labile uh, blood pressures with hyper and hypotension, or just plain orthostatic hypotension. Uh, they may develop cardiac arrhythmias, they may develop even neurogenic pulmonary edema, and may report changes in sweating. A smaller percentage of patients, approximately 5%, may have dysautonomia that affects the bladder in the form of urinary retention or incontinence, or the bowel in the form of constipation, ileus, uh, gastric distension, or even fecal incontinence. And in these uh, patients, um, a, a differential diagnosis of a spinal cord uh, dis disorder uh, arises. This table is uh, from the review by Dr. Alan Roper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992. And if you look at the top uh, uh, column or row, uh, paresthesia are frequent initially in approximately 70% of patients, but these patients don't often have sensory impairment. Uh, at the peak of the illness, however, both paresthesia and sensory impairment are seen in the vast majority of patients. Weakness involves the legs more than the arms initially, but at the peak of the illness involves both the arms and the legs in most patients. Um, the legs are affected more than the arms in over half of the patients, and approximately a third of the patients have equal weakness in the legs and the arms. Some patients progress rapidly to become ventilator dependent within hours or days, whereas others have mild progression for several weeks and never lose ambulation. Occasional patients may have a stuttering or even a stepwise progression. Weakness may range from mild to severe flaccid quadriplegia, and about a third of the patients never lose ambulation. The nadir of the weakness, as you see in the picture here, is reached by two weeks in anywhere from 50 to 80% of patients, depending on the series. These patients then enter a plateau phase. Again, the duration of the plateau phase varies. The median was found to be approximately one week in a large study published in Brain in 2014 that uh, evaluated almost uh, over 500 patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Following the plateau phase, uh, patients gradually start to recover. There have been diagnostic criteria established uh, for uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. The Ashbury criteria were the initial criteria. More recently, we have the Brighton criteria, which provide a level of diagnostic certainty from level one to four. However, overall, the features that are required for the diagnosis include progressive weakness uh, in more than one extremity uh, associated with areflexia or at least hyporeflexia. Uh, some features that strongly support the diagnosis uh, include the fact that progression of symptoms occurs uh, less, for a period of less than four weeks. There is relative symmetry of motor weakness, although as I mentioned earlier, it may be asymmetric in the, at the onset. Sensory symptoms and signs tend to be mild, but we do need to bear in mind uh, the fact that uh, there is a sensory variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome, and I will talk about that. Bilateral facial weakness and autonomic dysfunction when present support the diagnosis, uh, and the typical cerebrospinal fluid feature of high concentration of protein with the lack of pleocytosis and typical electrodiagnostic features of an acquired demyelinating syndrome further support the diagnosis. Um, having spoken about the typical presentation, let's focus a little bit on some of the variants that we see in clinical practice. 
The first variant that was described was Miller-Fisher syndrome, and many of you are familiar with this presentation of ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and areflexia without weakness. Most patients present with at least two of these features, and uh, they do have an elevated cerebrospinal fluid protein, and that many of you, as many of you are aware, they have the characteristic autoantibody to ganglioside uh, GQ1B. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere, Miller-Fisher syndrome accounts <clears throat> for approximately 5 to 10 percent of cases, but tends to be more frequent uh, in Eastern Asia, accounting for up to 25 percent of cases in Japan. Some of these patients may actually progress on just to develop the classic AIDP picture. Uh, Bickerstaff's brainstem encephalitis uh, is a variant of Miller-Fisher syndrome and is characterized by altern alteration in consciousness that may progress on to even coma. These patients have paradoxic hyperreflexia rather than areflexia. Uh, after initial descriptions of acute inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy, uh, we recognized that there were some patients who had axonal features and uh, the acute motor axonal neuropathy variant was reported in 1993 from northern China. Soon after that, acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy was reported. These cases have also been described from other countries, including here in the United States. The pharyngeal cervical brachial variant presents with ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, bifacial weakness, pharyngeal or bulbar weakness, neck flexor weakness spreading to the upper extremities. Uh, these patients have spared sensation and usually don't have weakness in the lower extremities. And as you can imagine, this really does bring up the diagnosis uh, or differential diagnosis of um, myasthenia gravis or botulism. The paraparetic variant presents with back pain, bilateral leg weakness, numbness, and areflexia that can mimic an acute cord lesion. Uh, local or restricted um, uh, variants such as bifacial weakness or bilateral six nerve palsies with paresthesia have also been described. Many of us uh, who uh, take care of these patients will see either a pure sensory ataxic variant or acute pan dysautonomia, often associated with sensory features. Two-thirds of patients report symptoms of a respiratory or a gastrointestinal tract infection before the onset of the disease. Uh, and in about half these patients, a specific type of infection can be identified. Respiratory infections are more frequent than GI infections. Um, of the GI infections, the vast majority are due to camp, uh, Campylobacter jejuni. Mycoplasma is also a bacterial infection that has been implicated. Of the viral infections, a cytomegalovirus is the most common, uh, usually associated with a respiratory illness as an antecedent. Epstein-Barr virus can also be associated. Uh, we do see um, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, with, uh, associated with HIV, usually at zero conversion or an early disease, hepatitis C, and of course now Zika. A few patients develop Guillain-Barre syndrome shortly after receiving a vaccine, and despite the fact that these are rare, obviously such uh, events cause considerable public concern. In the vaccination campaign against influenza A H1N1 in 1976 in the United States, uh, approximately 1 in 100,000 persons vaccinated developed Guillain-Barre syndrome. However, in the 2009 season, uh, the incidence was one per million that was uh, felt to be no different than after any seasonal flu vaccine. A few patients uh, have reported antecedents of pregnancy, uh, surgery, or epidural anesthesia. There are some feature, uh, features or clinical features that should uh, raise red flags to the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Patients who present with severe respiratory involvement with limited limb weakness at the onset usually do not have Guillain-Barre syndrome. 
Similarly, severe sensory signs with limited weak, weakness at onset is a red flag, although again, you have to bear in mind that we may be just dealing with a sensory variant as that I alluded to earlier. The bladder and bowel dysfunction in Guillain-Barre follows a fairly specific pattern uh, that one has to be aware of. Usually, when patients develop bladder and bowel dysfunction, they do so at the height of their illness when they have maximum uh, weakness. And that is transient and usually recovers before limb weakness starts recovering. So if you see a patient who has severe bladder or bowel dysfunction at the onset of the illness when weakness is not prominent, or if they have persistent bladder or bowel dysfunction during the illness, that should raise a red flag to the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre. Fever at the onset of illness is not usual because they've usually gotten over the antecedent infection. <coughs> I'm sorry. And oftentimes, um, at least the teaching when I trained in India and we saw a lot of paralytic poliomyelitis was children who develop a febrile illness and along with the fever develop uh, asymmetric weak weakness with extremely, exquisitely painful limbs usually have uh, paralytic polio and not Guillain-Barre syndrome. Other infections may also be at play here. Obviously, a sharp sensory level should bring up the diagnosis of a myelopathy. And if you have more than 50 lymphocytes per cubic millimeter in the cerebrospinal fluid or if there are um, polymorphonuclear lymphocytes uh, uh, in the cerebrospinal fluid, both of these should bring up other differential diagnoses. What is the diagnostic evaluation in these patients? A careful history and neurologic examination uh, is important, followed by laboratory testing, magnetic resonance imaging of the brain or the spine as appropriate, followed by electrodiagnostic studies and lumbar puncture. And I state this in no particular order. The mental status examination in these patients is usually normal, except for the few patients who have Bickerstaff's brainstem encephalitis. The cranial nerve examination typically reveals normal pupils, and that's an important factor when you see patients with the pharyngocervical brachial variant and you consider a diagnosis of botulism, because botulism often affects the pupils because of dysautonomia. Uh, you may see ptosis and ophthalmoparesis. Bifacial weakness is common, and of course, bulbar weakness may be seen in about 40%, as I mentioned. The motor examination reveals both proximal and distal weakness, which is largely symmetric, and legs are more involved than arms in uh, most pa patients. Uh, the brain review that I mentioned earlier uh, reported about 8% of patients with the paraparetic presentation. Sensory involvement uh, is in the form of large fiber sensory loss, uh, and therefore involves vibration and position sense. The ankle jerks are usually lost first. Uh, later, most patients develop diffuse areflexia or at least hyperreflexia. In the same series in brain, approximately 10% had normal reflexes despite having weakness in their arms and 2% uh, despite having weak legs. Uh, and in some of these patients, uh, normal reflexes persisted in the arms later on in the disease course as well. A small proportion of patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome, especially the acute motor axonal neuropathy variant, may have preserved or even exaggerated deep tendon reflexes, as also the patients with Bickerstaff encephalitis. However, for most uh, part, the presence of uh, exaggerated reflexes should prompt you into considering my acute myelopathies in the differential diagnosis. Routine laboratory tests are usually normal. Some patients may have mild elevation of serum creatine kinase. Mildly elevated liver enzymes may be seen. Consideration should be given to testing for Lyme antibody titers, heavy metal screen, toxicology screen, urine porphyrin testing uh, in the relevant clinical context. Uh, consideration to HIV testing, again, if there are risk factors for HIV. Please bear in mind that because this disorder occurs at zero conversion or early on, uh, the appropriate test to get is a PCR for a viral load and not the antibody testing because they may be antibody negative. Campylobacter jejuni antibodies really offer only prognostic information, and we'll talk about that later.
Uh, there was a lot of literature about anti-ganglioside antibodies um, in the 80s, uh, maybe the 70s and the 80s and the 90s probably. Uh, however, usually they do not change management and are not ordered in the clinical setting. The exception to this perhaps may be in the setting where Miller Fisher or Bickerstaff brainstem encephalitis is suspected uh, when we tend to order GQ1B antibodies because of their high sensitivity and specificity. But the fact remains that for most part, the results of these antibody testing is not available before we start uh, treatments, uh, treatment in these patients. Cerebrospinal fluid protein elevation without pleocytosis, the typical albuminocytologic dissociation, is the hallmark of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. However, when performed in the first 48 hours, 85% of patients may have normal protein. Uh, about two-thirds have elevated protein in the first week of the illness, and more than 90% do have this pattern in fully developed illness. Pleocytosis is unusual, and as I mentioned earlier, if you have more than 50 cells per cubic millimeter, Several differential diagnoses um, arise, including early HIV infection, Lyme disease, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, um, CMV polyradiculitis, sarcoidosis, and other inflammatory and infectious conditions. Uh, the absence of albuminocytologic dissociation in the first week does not exclude Guillain-Barre syndrome, and that's important to remember. Uh, these two boxes are from the same uh, paper in brain. If you notice in the upper box, normal cell counts of less than five per cubic millimeter were present in the vast majority of these 500 odd patients, uh, and more than 50 cells were not seen in any of these patients. The lower box uh, looks at protein elevation in the cerebrospinal fluid as a factor of the time between weakness and the lumbar puncture. In the first couple of days, only 50% of patients have elevated protein. By the end of the first week, two-thirds or more have elevated protein, but that leaves, still leaves us with a one-third who don't have the elevated protein, and that's important to remember. The goals of electrodiagnostic testing in Guillain-Barre syndrome are to localize abnormalities to the peripheral nerve and to demonstrate evidence of acquired demyelination. Early electrodiagnostic findings may be subtle, and repeat studies may be required uh, if the diagnosis is in doubt. The focus of the study is on nerve conduction testing rather than needle EMG, but both of these are complementary. Again, in that same series uh, from BRAIN 2014, in the first week of illness, approximately 48% of patients had demyelinating features on nerve conduction studies but 41% had equivocal nerve conduction studies. I will spend a few minutes talking about the differential diagnosis of the disorder. If you think about it, Guillain-Barre syndrome presents as an acute lower motor neuron disorder with weakness and areflexia. So let's talk about all of the lower motor neuron syndromes, starting from the anterior horn cells and going down in a neuroanatomic fashion. Uh, acute myelopathies, as we mentioned earlier, uh, are in the differential diagnosis, especially if, the, if you have suspicion for a spinal cord level. Uh, they may be compressive or non-compressive, and the problem is that in the acute phase, um, you may have spinal shock, and therefore limbs are flaccid, and the reflexes are absent, so these the tone and reflexes don't help you distinguish from an acute myelopathy. In addition to acute myelopathies, focused focal disorders of the anterior horn cells as part of paralytic poliomyelitis or West Nile virus infection may cause um, uh, a low motor neuron type of paralytic presentation. Many of these patients are sick uh, with evidence for meningitis, fever, etc. Coming down to the peripheral nerve, Critical illness neuropathy can present with a similar picture, but it's diagnosed by the company it keeps. So patients are sick, they're in the ICU, they have sepsis, they have multi-organ failure, et cetera. Lymphoma or electromeningeal carcinomatous meningitis oftentimes associated with sensory involvement as well. 
Toxic neuropathy, solvents, heavy metals. You have thallium, you have arsenic. Most of these patients have GI symptoms. They have skin manifestations. Uh, thallium causes alopecia and CNS manifestations. Um, a brief mention of marine toxins. Uh, these patients often present with severe paresthesias followed by weakness very rapidly. Uh, they can also have dysautonomia. Uh, and, uh, and here I'm talking about tetrodotoxin, which is due to pufferfish in ingestion, or saxitoxin or ciguatoxin. The history is really key here. Porphyrias, uh, you know the presentation with, uh, um, uh, hype, uh, with uh, the typical abdominal pain, the photosensitivity, uh, urinary findings, etc. Vasculitic neuropathy is associated with other uh, features of systemic involvement. We spoke about myasthenia gravis and botulism in the neuromuscular junction. Hypermagnesemia is an infrequent cause of neuromuscular junction blo blockade. In children, uh, tick paralysis can start, begin two to four days after uh, the tick bite. Uh, it reverses within 24 hours after tick removal, and the process here is a motor nerve terminal channel inhibition. Uh, coming down to muscle, there are idiopathic inflammatory myopathies uh, that can present quite rapidly sometimes, rarely, but you do see them. Rhabdomyolysis, critical illness myopathy, again distinguished by the company it keeps. Periodic paralysis or secondary hypokalemia with paralysis as well as hypophosphatemia. The bottom line, however, is that early Guillain-Barre syndrome is often a clinical diagnosis. Ancillary investigations, such as cerebral spinal fluid analysis and electrodiagnostic studies, are useful to exclude an alternative diagnosis, but may not help to confirm early Guillain-Barre syndrome. However, it's important to diagnose these patients early because early treatment improves outcome. I'm going to be very brief regarding pathogenesis in the interest of time. It's presumed autoimmune, but we don't know exactly what happens. A trivial infection triggers a humoral response, and these antibodies cross-react with, uh, with ganglicides in the phenomenon of molecular mimicry. There's complement activation, lymphocyte uh, cell infiltration of proximal nerves and nerve roots, and macrophage-mediated myelin stripping causing segmental demyelination. The pathology of uh, acute motor axonal neuropathy seems to be slightly different, but I'm not going to focus on this in the interest of time. What are the clinical pathologic correlates? Demyelination with conduction failure along motor nerve fibers is what leads to clinical weakness. Demyelination in large diameter sensory fibers leads to distal loss of vibration and position sense. Inflammation of peripheral nerve roots need, leads to pain, and inflammation in the autonomic ganglia causes dysautonomia. How do we manage these patients? Uh, supportive care and immunotherapy are the two mainstays of their care. Most patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome are admitted to the neurologic intensive care unit or at least to an intermediary uh, care unit uh, to reduce mortality and morbidity. Uh, we need to manage them very carefully and monitor for respiratory failure, dysautonomia. Um, Nosocomial infection is frequent, usually pneumonia or urinary tract infection, and one needs to be vigilant to these infections and treat them aggressively. Deep venous thrombosis and resultant thromboembolism are problems in these patients who are often immobile and need prophylaxis uh, with compression stock stockings and uh, anticoagulants. Nutritional support, including nasogastric tube support, or even percutaneous uh, endoscopic gastrotomy uh, if uh, bulbar paralysis uh, lasts for a significant period is important. SIADH can be associated with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and needs to be recognized and managed. If neuropathic pain does not respond to non-steroidal agents, other agents such as gabapentin, a pregabalin, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, tramadol, etc., uh, may need to be used. Passive range of movement to prevent contractures, prevention of decubitus ulcers, and prevention of corneal ulcers in patients who have bifacial weakness is important. Communication and emotional support cannot be understated because 
uh, even in patients who are not on the ventilator, this is scary. They get weak very acutely and unable to move. One needs to be able to talk to them about the prognosis, explain to them that they are going to get better most for the most part. And it's key in patients who are on the ventilator because they're, uh, they're often completely conscious. Clinical clues to impending respiratory failure include weakness of neck flexor muscles. Uh, you have them count after they take a deep inspiration, count as fast as possible. That's called the single breath count. If it's less than 20 or 30, or if they have a poor cough at bedside, these are signs that they may develop impending, uh, they have impending respiratory failure. They may also have tachypnea and paradoxical respiration. Tachycardia and diaphoresis may also imply uh, respiratory failure, although it may also imply just plain dysautonomia. The monitoring of these patients at the bedside, bedside is often performed by forced vital capacity measures or measures of maximal inspiratory pressure or maximal expiratory pressure. Um, some of you may be uh, aware of the uh, data from the Mayo Clinic in 2001 that suggested the 20-30-40 rule for intubation and ventilation of SVC less than 20 mils per kilogram, MIP less than minus 30 centimeters of water, or MEP less than 40. The problem with monitoring these is that it's not easy for patients to give you adequate effort, and there may be variation between trials. You have to interpret these in the clinical context. If the patient looks uh, stable and the numbers look bad, then you have to really worry that the numbers may not be reliable. The MIP and MEP especially may be difficult in the presence of bifacial weakness because patients can't hold on to the tube and give a good seal and blow hard. Another reason to intubate these patients prophylactically is an ineffective cough or an inability to handle secretion. Uh, I call this the respiratory pyramid. This is, again, from the uh, Roper review in NEJM, and I really like this. The middle of the pyramid shows uh, the vital capacity going from normal all the way down to 5 mils per kilogram. On the right side, you see the accompanying respiratory pathophysiology, and on the left, you see recommended ventilatory management. At about 30 uh, mils per kilogram, poor cough, uh, and, sec uh, and secretions start accumulating, chest physical therapy is recommended. Uh, at about 20, the psi is compromised and atelectasis and hypoxia begin, and incentive spirometry and deep breathing is necessary. At about 15 is when patients are usually intubated. Dysautonomia can cause sudden changes in heart rate and blood pressure or arrhythmias, as I mentioned. It's important when managing autonomic instability to be extremely conservative and avoid aggressively treating blood fl pressure fluctuations because patients tend to be very sensitive to medications. If you overtreat the highs, this may exacerbate the, roles, uh, the lows. For instance, if you overtreat tachycardia or hypertension, you may then, uh, it may then result in patients with prolonged hypotension or bradycardia. It's often best to avoid treating the fluctuations, if at all possible. And if uh, treatment is necessary, the uh, treatments are usually short-acting medications rather than long-acting uh, medications. I'm sorry. One other thing uh, that's important to bear in mind is to treat aggravating factors. Pain can aggravate hypertension or, or, ta or cause tachycardia. Hypovolemia can aggravate orthostatic um, hypotension and needs to be treated. The mainstays of immunotherapy, plasma exchange, and intravenous immunoglobulin. Plasma exchange uh, was the first treatment to proven to be effective in these patients in two large trials, the North American trial and the French trial. In the interest of time, I will not go through all the details on this slide, but suffice to say that in both studies, plasma exchange performed within two weeks from symptom onset consistently demonstrated a statistically significant reduction in time to weaning from the ventilator up by 13 to 14 days and in time to walk unaided by 32 to 41 days. In addition, the French cooperative study also demonstrated uh, that the 
patients who required ventilatory assistant, assistance after entry into the trial were significantly less in the plasma exchange group. Intravenous immunoglobulin was first demonstrated to be um, efficacious in Guillain-Barre syndrome by the Dutch Guillain-Barre study group two decades ago. In this study, they compared IVIG and plasma exchange, and IVIG was found to be actually better than plasma exchange. So this then brought up the question, is, really, is it really true that IVIG may be better than plasma exchange? However, uh, this slide shows you the North American trial plasma exchange results and the Dutch trial plasma exchange results. And you will notice that the group that received plasma exchange in the Dutch trial really did not do as well as the group that received plasma exchange in the um, North American trial. So it's felt that group Im imbalances probably account for this difference between IVIG and plasma exchange in the Dutch trial. And a subsequent large trial, the plasma exchange sandoglobulin Guillain-Barre trial, uh, conclusively showed that there is no real difference between plasma exchange and IV immunoglobulin. And I will show you that in a couple of slides. So how do we give intravenous immunoglobulin? The dose is two grams per kilogram. Over, uh, and whether to give it over two days, that's one gram per kilogram per day, or the same dose over five days, 0.4 grams per kilogram per day for five days, has really not been fully evaluated. There's some data in children that children who received the shorter course had more treatment-related fluctuations than children who received the longer course. So what do we do with patients in whom uh, we've treated them with either plasma exchange or IVIG, and it's been 10 to 14 days. They're still significantly weak and not getting better. Do we then treat them with the other uh, medication or other modality? Um, if we give them IVIG, it doesn't make sense to give them plasma exchange after that because we're just going to take away the IVIG that we gave them. If we give them plasma exchange, should we then give them IVIG? The study that I mentioned, the plasma exchange and sandoglobulin Guillain-Barre study, uh, looked at this. So they randomized patients to three groups, plasma exchange alone, IVIG alone, or plasma exchange followed by IVIG, and conclusively demonstrated that there was really no difference between groups, meaning that plasma exchange and IVIG were indeed equally efficacious, and plasma exchange followed by IVIG was not indicated. Uh, the American Academy of Neurology uh, practice guideline for immunotherapy systematically evaluated all of these studies. Uh, the recommendations were that treatment with plasma exchange or intravenous immunoglobulin hastens recovery from Guillain-Barre. Both of them are equally effective, but plasma exchange may carry a greater risk of side effects and may perhaps be more difficult to administer. And I think that's really what uh, influences the choice of treatments in the clinical setting. Combining the two treatments is not recommended. And I did not really discuss uh, steroids uh, for lack of time, uh, but uh, this um, review and subsequent reviews, including a Cochrane review, also found that steroids are not beneficial in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Very quickly, plasma exchange requires a large double lumen catheter, uh, usually through a central line, although there are centers that can actually do this with a peripheral axis. Potential complications include blood pressure instability or hypotension. And this can be a real problem in patients with severe dysautonomia. Infection, pneumothorax, thrombocytopenia or anemia, prolonged clotting parameters, hypocalcemia or citrate toxicity are other, param are other problems. And we, need, uh, we usually monitor labs in these patients every day. And if clotting parameters are not uh, optimal, tend to hold plasma exchange. Complications of IVIG, infusion reactions are not infrequent. Uh, they're usually managed with pre-medication and also with medication during the course of the infusion. The medications include acetaminophen, uh, diphenhydramine, or even intravenous uh, methylprednisolone if necessary.
Infusion reactions are also related to the speed of the, or the rate of the infusion. It's important to start the rate slowly and escalate gradually, and when patients develop reaction, oftentimes dropping the rate uh, helps with these reactions. Acute renal failure is a rare but serious complication. Um, some uh, seen in diabetics, especially with the underlying renal impairment, and uh, related to the use of sucrose as a diluent in the IVIG. Neutropenia and even thrombocytopenia may occur. Heart failure uh, as a, uh, a factor of uh, uh, fluid overload may also be an issue. Because of the hyperviscosity of the molecule, it's a big molecule. Uh, and in patients who already have underlying risk factors for thromboembolism, throm thromboembolic complications have been described, albeit rarely. Um, IgA deficiency is extremely rare in the general population. Patients who receive uh, uh, IVIG can also have a delayed skin reaction with desquamation of the skin. I'd like to mention briefly treatment-related fluctuations because I often get a call from my colleagues about this um, in the clinical setting. Approximately 10% of patients treated with IVIG or plasma exchange deteriorate uh, at least one grade after initial improvement of stabilization. So they stop progressing or they even get better, but then they deteriorate. This is uh, supposed to be due to a prolonged immune attack on the nerves. And the bottom line, uh, again, not going into great detail, the bottom line is they usually improve after retreatment with the same modality that they received. So if they receive plasma exchange, a few more exchanges, or if they received IVIG, retreatment with IVIG, two grams per, kilo, per kilogram for another five days. When they have treatment-related fluctuations, it's important to consider acute onset CIDP. So CIDP is a chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy and acquired polyneuropathy that can sometimes present very acutely. Acute CIDP should be considered when patients who are initially diagnosed with, uh, with Guillain-Barre syndrome have three or more periods of clinical deterioration or if their deterioration occurs eight or more weeks after disease onset. Clinical clues to this is also the fact that many of these patients tend to have less severe weakness uh, and maintain the ability to ambulate independently at the worst of their weakness, and they usually don't have cranial nerve dysfunction. This differentiation is important because treatments are different. There is no real data regarding immunotherapy of variants, and the bottom line is you treat variants similar to treatment of AIDP. Similarly, in children, the, the treatment it remains uh, similar. Prognosis, mortality, approximately 5% up to 11% in some series. It's important to uh, remember that the mean time to complete recovery is almost seven months in 80% of cases. Uh, most improvement happens within the first year after onset, but can continue after this period, and it's important to explain this to patients. About 65% have minor residual deficits and 10 to 15% with significant residual deficits in the form of weakness, fatigue, or pain. Some prognostic indicators include older age at onset of the disease, rapid progression before presentation, ventilator dependency, and preceding infection with cytomegalovirus or Campylobacter jejuni. Uh, patients with acute motor axonal neuropathy have a more delayed recovery usually, but there are some patients who recover fairly quickly because of the underlying pathophysiology, so it's important to bear in mind that a diagnosis of acute motor axonal neuropathy does not necessarily mean bad prognosis. Uh, the era uh, there is a very nice online prognostic tool that is very useful in the clinical setting. Uh, this is uh, from the... Uh, International GBS Outcome Study Group. Uh, there are two of these scores. The EGRI score is the Erasmus GBS Respiratory Insufficiency Score. It predicts the probability of respiratory insufficiency within the first week of admission. The Outcome Score, on the other hand, predicts the probability of walking independently at two weeks after hospital admission. 
Uh, the website is uh, here in red. And when you go into the website, this is what it looks like. It asks you to agree with the terms of use. You start the tool. You, it asks you what tool would you like to use. So what do you want to predict? Do you want to predict risk of respiratory failure in the first week or risk of um, uh, or uh, inability to walk six months after admission? You pick what you want. You put in your patient data, and it will give you the score and also the uh, risk uh, in terms of percentage of either developing respiratory failure or of being unable to walk six months after admission.